Good morning, family. We're going to go ahead and dig in this morning as we continue in our series of reclaiming this first Sunday of February. Um, we are reading from the book of Ruth, the first chapter in its entirety. I'm um, reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, and it reads as follows. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in a country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion, and they were Ephraimites from Bethlehem in Judah. And they went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons, and these two Moabite, these took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And when they had lived there about ten years, both Milan and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord was considered, had considered his people and given them food. And so she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find security, each of you in the house of your husband. And then she kissed them and they wept aloud. And they said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husband? Turn back my daughters go your way for I am too old to have a husband and even if I thought there was hope for me even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons would you even wait until they were grown would you then refrain from marrying no my daughters it has been far more bitter for me than for you because the hand of the Lord has turned against me and then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And so she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth says, do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will will lodge your people shall be my people and your god my god where you die i will die there will i be buried may the lord do thus and so to me and more so as well even if even death parts you from me and when naomi saw this that she was determined to go with her she said no more to her so the two of them went on until they came to bethlehem and when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, oh, is this Naomi? And she said to them, call me no longer Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has dealt harshly with me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Let's pray. God, grant to us the ability in this moment to have ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a will to have the courage to respond. In Jesus' name. So, a man named Elimelech and his wife Naomi leave their Jewish homeland of Bethlehem, which later becomes the birthplace of Jesus. And in the midst of Bethlehem, or in the midst of them leaving Bethlehem, there is a famine. 
And so they travel with their two sons, Milan and Chilion, to the land of Moab. But after arriving in Moab, Elimelech dies, and Naomi's two sons marry Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. Things seemingly remain steady for the next 10 years before the death of both Milan and Chilion. And Naomi finds herself in a foreign land in the throes of grief with two daughters-in-law, but no blood relatives. Now there are few among us who genuinely know the gut-wrenching pain and emptiness of the death of a child. A few more may know the death of a beloved spouse, but even fewer of us know the death of both a beloved spouse and all, all considerate of your children. Naomi was in the dark and difficult place, but she heard that things had become better back home in Judah, which is where Bethlehem is located and decides by necessity to return home. The despair of the famine had caused her to leave home. And now the despair of loss and grief was causing her to return home. And recognizing that she cannot provide stability for Orpah and Ruth, she blesses them and she tells them to return to their families of origin. They refuse, pledging to stay with her. She presses again in pain and Orpah relents. She kisses her mother-in-law and returns to her people. But Ruth clings to Naomi. Naomi implores Ruth to not stay, but Ruth is adamant. Do not press me to leave you or to stop following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May God let me share your experiences, even if we are departed by death. Such powerful, intimately committed words, words often maybe uh, misappropriately used um, in wedding ceremonies, but this marks just how committed Ruth was to Naomi. And so Naomi sees that Ruth will not change her mind and relents. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, like most small towns, news of their arrival causes a stir and the women recognize her. Naomi, still defined by her pain, says to them, do not call me Naomi, which means my joy, but call me Mara, which means bitter, because God has dealt bitterly with me. I left here full with my family, but I return empty. How ironic it is that she left Bethlehem during a famine and returned at the beginning of a harvest. The bond between Naomi and both of her daughters-in-law was strong enough to make them desire to stay with her rather than return home. This highlights for us that blood family may not always be friends, but friends are always family. Now there could be any number of factors at play in them wanting to stay with her, not the least of which um, is a shared experience of grief, but it is a clear reflection of a close-knit relationship between these two women and Naomi. Naomi refers to them as her daughters and they love one another. However, Naomi had experienced deeply rooted ongoing pain. I call it um, complex or compounded grief. And I can see evidence in this account of how such sustained pain had moved her into a practice of doing what she thought was right in giving love, but also caused her to resist the love others wished to give to her. Persistent pain can do a number of things to our emotional and psychological patterns that uh, may vary for all of us, but a few common ones are perhaps present in Naomi's experience that we can name or at least um, potentially highlight as possibilities. 
For one, her resistance to receiving love could have been um, an attempt to avoid what she perceived as possible future pain. Her husband and sons had all died. In addition to her genuine love for her daughters, um, such a pattern of loss could have made her fear that her daughters would also die if they stayed with her. This idea that somehow she attracts or causes the death of those that she loves, that she is destined in some way to be abandoned. Even as she expressed feeling like God had turned God's back on her. So rather than receive love and risk her worst fears coming true, no matter how unreasonable they may seem to us, she in turn tries to control an unwanted outcome on the front end by pushing them away from her so that they don't have the, the opportunity to be hurt in proximity to her. But then there's the impact of such beliefs or that such beliefs may have, um, may have had on her sense of self. This idea that she may have felt unworthy of love not just because those close to her died, but because in this instance, she had nothing of value in her mind to offer her daughters. This belief that we must earn our love, that love must always at every moment be transactional. This is important because in part, um, beliefs like this one or beliefs that have this kind of nature to them also still stem from very real lived experience. I mean, they stem from reality. They are um, supported by the realities that we live in. In this culture, women needed men in order to be secure. They needed a husband in order to have access to what they needed. So it makes sense that Naomi would feel that what was best for Ruth and Orpah would be to return home and find new husbands. This was in essence her saying that her only value was found in what she could provide. And this is indicative of both her pain and social experience. And this could have been at play in her resistance to receiving love. But to love and to not to love and then to not be loved in return is a contradiction because that is not the true intention of love. Love is not either or it is both and giving and receiving. In a book I'm reading by Nettie Okafor entitled Who Fears Death, the main character is asked by her elder mentor, is it better to give or receive? And she pauses for a moment and then she says, neither, they are the same. We were created because our God doesn't just love, but desires to be loved by us. The ongoing pain of our experience and how the beliefs of an oppressive culture get woven into our theology, into our beliefs, into our psychology, all impacts our ability to give and receive love in healthy ways. A constant state of survival or crisis mode can make us weary of going deep in love or question what love even looks like when we see it. Now, February, y'all. It's Black History Month, but it's also the love month that holds the celebration of Valentine's. And so I invite you this month to lean into the multiple forms of black and brown love, particularly healthy self-love. But today we will journey through some important points to remember about the love of friendship amid pain as we look at the love between Naomi and Orpah, but especially at the love and friendship between Naomi and Ruth. So let's look at these parts of friendship that I think is important for us to remember as we reclaim love through friendship. First, first is the kiss versus the cling. Some friendships, y'all, are for a lifetime and some are only for a season. 
I have led so many or had so many conversations with um, college students, young adults or others who struggle with um, visits home after one or two years in college or away from home working. And time and time again, they express that friends and some family back home say they have changed. When in truth, um, the matter of higher education, the matter of maturing and growing, that whole experience um, is designed to change you. And if it hasn't changed a person, how they um, think or influenced how they think or make decisions or act or, um, yeah, or act on, in terms of their behavior, then they're wasting their time. And in the case of college, they're wasting their money. Life experiences change us. And some experiences are designed to specifically change you, hopefully for the better, like discipleship, school, therapy, marriage, parenthood, etc. However, each of these examples represents both the end of some close relationships and the longevity of others. So for example, I will be a parent for the rest of my life. But when I became a mother, I did not have the time I used to have to spend with some friends. We may, you know, connect from time to time. Um, but if their lives didn't or don't accommodate children, then the friendship shifts. And though I appreciate the time and the support of that person, that season ended. There are friends for life stages and friends based upon geography and friends based upon certain life experiences. And if those friends are seasonal, then we have to be able to recognize that and appreciate the contributions made during the time of that friendship. Orpah's kiss marked the parting shift in her relationship to Naomi. Now I am sure, quite sure, Orpah did not stop loving Naomi and probably had to grieve even the separation, but the season for their close knit connection had ended. But then there are close friendships that will last all your life. And these are the kinds of friendships that require patience and commitment through rough times. And they are not as abundant in number as the kiss relationships. <laughs> Though you may be at different life stages, the kind of effort it takes to remain steady through those changes is difficult to do with a whole lot of people. Like we can only go deep with a few. And so we see in, um, in verse 12, Naomi being willing or she had to be willing to let Orpah go just like she had to be willing to let Ruth remain. Are there some friendships you're holding on to that you know should have changed a long time ago? Or are there friendships you gave up on that were worth saving? Maybe you should sit down with someone who disciples you or um, go to a live group or talk through some of this. There is safety in the counsel of the godly. And I believe this deserves some reflection as we talk about reclaiming our love, particularly love, from places of pain through friendship. Second thing I think we need to remember as we see in this passage is that we sometimes miss the opportunity for great friendships because of our own biased boxes, our own biased boxes. Ruth and Naomi were not typical friends. They were different generations or ages. They were of different ethnicities and cultures. They had different religions and family backgrounds. And yet this strong friendship and loyalty developed. Friends are a blessing from God. And there are times when we block the blessing of a beautiful friendship because we allow the fear of difference to become a threat. I grew up loving stories and I ran across this story from my childhood, um, one of my childhood books that I really, really love. I may have shared it in this space before, but it goes, there was once a little red lighthouse that sat on the shore of the Hudson River. And this lighthouse was so proud. 
He would call to the ships of the sea with his light saying, warning, warning. And some nights when the fog was heavy, he would have two voices, flash, turn, flash, would go his light and his fog horn would yell danger to alert the ships that rocks were near when there was a thick fog. And he would think to himself, why well, I'm so important. What would the ships do without me? But then one day, men came and began to build beside the little red lighthouse. And for months they came with their machines and materials until finally a great gray bridge spanned the width of the river. And when night fell, the little red lighthouse looked up at that great gray bridge at the highest peak. And it saw a light twice the size and brightness of its own. Turn, turn, flash. And the little red lighthouse felt so small and insignificant. And so he did not shine his light. And that night a storm rose on the river. And the little black boat came tug, tug, tugging along down that river. He strained to see the light of the lighthouse and then he pressed to hear the horn, but could not until bash, he crashed on the rocks of the shore. The great gray bridge called out to the little red lighthouse, little brother, little brother, where is your light? Am I a brother of yours? The lighthouse says, your light was so big and so bright, I thought my light was not needed anymore. No, little brother. I call to the ships of the air, but you are still the master of the sea. We are so often threatened by differences. And it is a part of the culture that we lived in. It has been exacerbated in this culture over the last four years. And in our threat or our feeling threatened by differences, not only do we deny our true selves, but we deny the opportunity to learn from what others have to offer. That difference is not automatically defined as deficient as white supremacy defines it. This is why opposites attract. Your strengths are designed to build my weakness and vice versa. And yet we can spend a lifetime in a friendship and never realize that what frustrates me the most about you or about my friend is probably something that I am here to help them grow in or they are here to help me grow in. My obsessive punctuality or your excessive tardiness are destined to me in a way that challenges me to slow down and you to put some pep in your step designed to bring us both to the balance, the ebb and flow of life. A good friend of mine says that his wife is his best friend and that that um, were she not frugal, he would spend all that money. But if he did not have the freedom in spending, she would never have fun. But that it took them nearly 20 years to figure that out. I give them a shout out too. They're celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary this weekend. There are brothers, sisters, siblings of different ethnicities, faiths, and beliefs that have something we need. We must challenge ourselves to step outside of our biased box and extend an invitation as the great gray bridge or to accept one like the little lighthouse. Consider one person in your path regularly who you would consider yourself to have nothing in common with and invite them to coffee or lunch at a distance or a Zoom call, whatever safe in this pandemic. But third, friendships are conduits of God's grace. There was not only mutual benefit in the friendship for Naomi and Ruth, but there was mutual salvation. There are many times when we are friends to someone who for um, a season cannot for any number of reasons be a friend to us or vice versa, right? 
Wisdom is um, really key in recognizing those relationships. But deep, long lasting friendships are conduits of grace for both people. So it's not like one person is always pulling and another is always giving, but rather there is um, this grace, this pendulum that swings back and forth. So even if you can't always give, it's always going back and forth. And Ruth refused to leave Naomi and pressed to love her at a time when Naomi could not fully give back to her the support that she was giving. However, Naomi had clearly been a strong support to Ruth over the past 10 years. It was no light thing to leave your homeland and follow a friend to the extent that you were willing to consider their faith, their God, and their people as your own. Naomi's relationship to Ruth brings Ruth into relationship with God, salvation. And later in the count, Naomi helps Ruth remarry. And there is this theme of giving and receiving, being full and emptied out, famine and harvest that is lurking. It's like a pendulum. A movie came out in 1989 that I used to watch as a kid starring Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder called See No Evil, Hear No Evil, which was a comedy about two men who witness a murder. Now, Wally, Richard Pryor, is a black man who hears the murder. And Dave, Gene Wilder, is a deaf man or deaf white man who sees the murder and their unlikely friendship is cultivated by this life changing experience. What makes the movie so funny is how in scene after scene, they have to really work and struggle to use their strengths in order to cover each other's deficiencies in order to remain safe. There is a constant back and forth of giving and receiving, reaping and sowing, emptying and filling. Perhaps take some time later today, later this week, and ask what do I contribute to those I consider my friends? When then consider um, what they contribute to you. Is there giving and receiving? And if you are bold, have a conversation together and figure out with some of your friends if there is giving and receiving, or if one or the other is being sucked dry. Have you ever asked, how can I be a better friend to you? Deep and healthy friendships reflect and embody God's grace in a way that should be acknowledged, intentional and reciprocal. True friendships help us in this sanctification process, this process of becoming holy, this process of becoming who we were truly intended to be. But then finally, as we're wrapping up, God honors the devotion of a good friend. Good friends are people who press to give you what you need even when you don't know you need it. Naomi pressed her daughters-in-law to return home because it was what she felt they needed, even if they did not want it. And Ruth pressed to stay with Naomi because Naomi needed her too and didn't know it. Good friends are not scared away by your pain. Good friends may not always get it right, but they will keep trying to. Naomi is restored to a place of joy by the marriage and birth of Ruth's child, which allows her to be herself as her name means my joy. God honors her through this relationship. Ruth gives birth to a son named Obed. Hear me, y'all. Obed is the father of Jesse and Jesse is the father of David, King David's line, fathers Jesus Christ, the son of God, the savior of the world. Is it not interesting that the book is named Ruth and not Naomi, even though Ruth was not originally a Jew? Her love and devotion to Naomi aligns her with the greatest gift known to humanity the salvation of Jesus Christ. 
Christ who says, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friend. For everything I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. To be befriended by God. Who says that what is mine is yours. A savior who models for us what it means to move beyond like filia or brotherly, sisterly love to an agape, selfless, altruistic love of assurance in God, self and others. We see in Jesus the friend that Henry Nouwen describes. Jesus is a friend who may not answer all of our questions because we are often not ready to receive the answers. But Jesus is very present in our pain. Jesus awaits with us and he weeps with us in a way that brings us to the freedom and reality that we have no control over the things that cause us pain oftentimes, but that we never have to endure pain alone. It is through this path of relationship, support, love, giving, taking, that healing comes to us. And Henry Nouwen captures this well. This is what he says. When we honestly ask ourselves which person in our lives means the most to us, we often find that it is those who instead of giving advice, solutions, or cures have chosen rather to share our pain and to touch our wounds with a warm and tender hand. The friend who can be silent with us in a moment of despair or confusion, who can stay with us in an hour of grief and bereavement, who can tolerate not knowing, not curing, not healing, and face with us the reality of our powerlessness. That is a friend who cares. You all, that is the friend we have in Jesus. And that is the love I believe God calls us to between one another as siblings, that we might be friends to one another. And so as we prepare to come to the table today, we remember that Jesus says there is no greater love that we can have than for one or that one would lay down their life for a friend. You ever noticed how Jesus never lorded himself over us, never lorded himself over his followers, but rather he says, I call you friend. Jesus invites us into mutual vulnerability. Jesus is the friend whose pain and suffering on our behalf stands as a permanent assurance that we are worthy of love because the greatest love has already been given to us. So as you gather your elements for communion, trust the power and grace of God to be with you wherever you watch this from. Trust the love of God to heal you, to stretch you, to secure you, and to reclaim all areas of loving in your life. The table of our Lord is abundant and it is rich in the things that we need most. And it gives us the opportunity to practice the full intention of love. As God already loves us, we come to this table today, trusting God, which is an act of love towards God. We come to the table acknowledging the ways we have caused God pain, which is another act of love towards God. We receive God's love and we give love back, which is the true intention of love. And so let us pause for a moment and trust God's love enough for us to confess and invite God into our darkest places. Invite God into the places we are most likely to try to hide from God's love. And there may be any number of reasons why we would do that, but I want you to just take a moment and spend some time in silence 
with our God as we prepare to receive the grace of God's body and blood. So take a moment. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise and we confess that we have not been perfect. We confess, Almighty God, that even when we act like we're perfect, we know that we have not been. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have often failed at loving our neighbors as ourselves, as we fail at even loving ourselves properly. And so God, we confess to you and we place ourselves fully in your hands. All the good, all the regrets, all of the things that we would have done differently, God, we give them all to you, not just in part, but all. And God, we say, take them and make them new, create in us a clean heart and renew in us a right spirit. God, we pray that you will bless the elements that are before us, the representation of your body and the representation of your blood that these elements may be literal grace as a sacrament and an ordinance comes into our bodies god that we may receive right where we are exactly what we need by your providence and by your wisdom god that you will shift you will heal you will break free you will deliver god you will make a way you will provide god you will lift us up and allow us to transcend the muck that we so often wade in in this world that we might see so that when we place our feet on solid ground again, we may walk clearly and not be bogged down by the smog. God bless us and bind us as your people. Bring to us the love of friendship and grant us the grace we need to have the courage to reclaim love from pain. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.